often find myself down rabbit holes when I stop reading, and over the weekend I have found myself well and truly stuck down one particular hole, so I thought I would share it with you. It's about Sir Thomas More, or Saint Thomas More as Roman Catholics have declared him, one of the most remarkable men that England has ever produced. Thomas More was a polyglot and a polymath. He was at the very forefront of the introduction of the ideas of Renaissance humanism, the new thinking, into England. As well as being well-versed in the classics and being intellectually curious, he was also a very loyal son of the Catholic Church. Those three things are not incompatible. So Thomas's father, Sir John More, was a lawyer and a judge. And Thomas entered the law too, one of the professions that allowed bright young men in Tudor England to use their gifts and rise up the social ladder. He was an MP from 1504 and soon found himself in royal service. He served first as Master of Requests, dealing with the petitions people made to the King for redress. He was appointed to the Privy Council also in 1514 and was sent on numerous diplomatic missions. In 1521, he was Under Secretary of the Exchequer, acting in effect as the King's personal secretary. Then in 1525, his rise continued. He became Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and then in 1529, Lord Chancellor, one of the great officers of state, succeeding Cardinal Wolsey. He was the first layman to hold this office in many centuries, an office in which he was head of the judiciary, he was Speaker of the House of Lords and Keeper of the Great Seal of England. It was a powerful position. Thomas More's most well-known written work, Utopia, first published in 1516, is a discourse on an imagined ideal society. In the first edition of the work is a map of the mythical island of Utopia, his literary creation, drawn by Ambrose, the elder brother of Hans Holbein. If you look carefully at this map, it reveals within the shapes and contours of the geography of Utopia the outline of a skull. The image is a memento mori, a reminder of death, a common conceit in this period. Now, Thomas More lived in a far from ideal society. He lived in a difficult age, a time in which men rose to power very quickly at the whim of princes, and they also fell from favour equally swiftly. And this video is all about the fall and demise of Thomas More, and the very interesting fate of his body, particularly his head. If you like my channel, there are a number of ways you can support me if you feel able to do so. The first is by liking and sharing the content and subscribing to the channel. That way more people see my videos. You could also subscribe to my magazine The Antiquary, which is full of articles and features all like the videos on here and is copiously illustrated. Someone said recently that it's like receiving a miniature coffee table book each month. Publishing the Antiquary supports this channel directly, as this is how I make my living, and it allows me to spend more time creating lots of interesting content for you here. A magic link should have popped up above to take you to the website if you're interested. Thomas More lost his head in 1535 due to his unwillingness to compromise his own conscience for political expediency. He refused to assent to Henry VIII's demand that all should accept his supremacy of the Church of England and also recognise his divorce from Catherine of Aragon and his marriage to Anne Boleyn. In 1534, all subjects of the King were required to assent to and swear an oath to accept two Acts of Parliament and there was a three-line whip for men who were prominent and Moore was among the most prominent. Those acts were the Act of Supremacy that declared Henry to be the head of the church in England and with it came a new Act of Succession which proclaimed Elizabeth, Henry's daughter by Anne Boleyn, as his legitimate successor. Only two prominent men politically were willing to put their head above the parapet and dissent. One was Thomas More and the other was John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester. Under a separate act, the Treason Act of 1534, Parliament had declared 
that a refusal to take the oath to accept these two acts, to accept Henry as head of the church and Anne Boleyn as queen, was an act of treason, and treason was punishable by death. Sir Thomas More was put on trial on the 1st of July 1535 for violating the Treason Act and was accused of doing three things. Firstly, of what was called malicious silence, a crime that is worthy of the Thought Police in George Orwell's 1984. Under this charge, saying nothing about the King's supremacy, and More was very guarded in his speech in this matter, was in itself a crime, as it implied he had something to hide. Nothing less than openly saying that you agreed with Henry's supremacy would do. Then he was accused of malicious conspiracy, of talking about these matters with Bishop Fisher. Thirdly, he was accused of speaking openly in front of Richard Rich, who was the Solicitor General for Wales, about whether Parliament had the power to make Henry head of the church. The judges in the trial, which took place in Westminster Hall, were heavily stacked against him. One was Thomas Audley, who had replaced him as Lord Chancellor, and the other three were all part of Anne Boleyn's family. There was her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, her father, Thomas Boleyn, the Earl of Wiltshire, and her brother, George Boleyn, Lord Rochford. There was no chance. Thomas More was found guilty by the jury of 12 London citizens, within minutes. They had no choice but to do that. Once found guilty and aware of his fate, he then spoke openly as to his objections to the king's supremacy and his marriage to Anne Boleyn. He had nothing to lose. More was taken to the Tower of London and he was executed on the morning of the 6th of July 1535 on Tower Hill, just outside the walls of the Tower of London. It was a public execution. There is absolutely no doubt that Thomas More died for his conscience and he went to the scaffold with a full hope in Christ. If the contemporary sources are to be believed, he covered his own eyes and he laid his own head on the block, facing the headsman's axe with great courage. When Henry heard of More's execution, he is said to have blamed Anne Boleyn for his death. Apparently, he would have been happy simply to incarcerate more for life than to give him a martyr's death. For Anne Boleyn, the death of Thomas More began her own decline from the king's favour. Thomas More's headless body was buried in an unmarked grave in the church of St Peter ad Vincula, St Peter in Chains, within the walls of the Tower of London. He was buried close to his friend Bishop Fisher, who had been executed only a few weeks before. His ward, Margaret Clement, who he'd brought up almost as his own daughter, had witnessed his execution, and she and Margaret Roper, Moore's eldest daughter, would undertake his burial, wrapping his corpse in a simple shroud. In short order, Moore would be joined under the floor of St Peter's by Anne Boleyn, her brother Lord Rochford, who had been one of the judges at his trial, and many others who lost their heads on Tower Hill through Henry VIII's ire. There is a tradition that starts with Weaver in his volume Ancient Funeral Monuments, published in 1631, that Thomas More's body was later removed from the tower to the chapel he had built at Chelsea Old Church, close to his home in Chain Walk. Elements of this chapel, which was in the latest Renaissance style, remain, though it was rebuilt after significant damage in the Second World War. It has capitals designed most probably by Hans Holbein, who contributed to the engravings in Utopia and who Thomas More introduced to England. The chapel, completed in 1528, is on the south side of the chancel, and there's a monument to More that he himself erected during his lifetime in the chancel beside the entrance to the chapel. It has a large Gothic surround and frames a very flowery Latin inscription that is More's own work. During his life, Thomas More would often be found in this chancel beside his own monument, dressed in a surplice and singing at Mass. Despite More's desire to be buried here, the freehold of the chapel came with his property in Chain Walk, 
and that had been confiscated when he was attainted for high treason, so it is unlikely that burial there would have been a possibility. There is a long tradition that Thomas More's head was recovered and was buried elsewhere. The tradition can be traced back to Thomas Stapleton's biography of More, published in 1588, and there is little reason to doubt it. The story Stapleton relates is that after a month on a spike on London Bridge, the head of Thomas More was removed to make way for the heads of More of Henry VIII's victims, and at this point it was acquired by More's eldest daughter, Margaret Roper. The usual procedure when a head was placed on a spike was that it was first parboiled in a tanning solution, usually oak bark, to preserve it for longer and to deter vermin. When more space was needed, heads were removed from the spikes and simply tossed into the River Thames. Margaret, according to Stapleton, secured her father's head by bribing the executioner, whose job it was to perform this rather grisly task. Margaret and Moore's friends were certain that it was his head, as they'd kept a careful watch on the spikes, and that a tooth was missing that Moore had lost in life. Stapleton, who was a Catholic apologist and was looking for signs of sanctity in Moore, says that his countenance was almost as beautiful as before, but that his beard, which was white at his death, was now a reddish-brown colour, which can be accounted for by the parboiling process. Stapleton also tells us that Margaret Roper kept the head of her father preserved in spices for the remainder of her life, and that at the time he was writing in the 1580s, it was kept by one of her descendants. Anthony O. Wood, in his work Athenae Oxoniensis, written in the 1680s, gives an account of what happened next, According to him, the head was kept in a lead box and that Margaret Roper kept it with great devotion and that at some point it was put into a burial vault under the chapel of the Roper family that was built onto the side of St Dunstan's Church in Canterbury, where it doth yet remain, Wood says, standing on the coffin of Margaret uh, buried there. Later sources rather embroider that story and have Margaret Roper buried holding the head of her father in her hands, but this seems unlikely. St Dunstan's Church in Canterbury was the parish church of Margaret Roper and her husband William, and their Canterbury townhouse, Place House, was just a stone's throw from the church. Although most of Place House is now gone, the gateway built of brick remains now known as Roper Gate, and it gives some indication of just how impressive this lost house must have been. From the late 15th century, the Ropers, as one of the prominent families of the parish, maintained a family burial chapel on the south side of the chancel of the church, dedicated to St Nicholas. This was rebuilt in the 1520s for William Roper's father John, in fine brick, just like his house. There are two 16th century brick monuments within this chapel, though sadly they are denuded of their brass inscriptions, but they're almost certainly monuments to the Ropers. The one to the east is probably the monument of John Roper, who died in 1524, and his wife Jane Finneau, who died in 1544. And the other is uh, the monument of their son William Roper, who died in 1578, and his wife Margaret Moore, who died in 1544. Now, it has been suggested that Margaret Moore, Margaret Roper, may have been buried in the chapel that Thomas More had constructed in Chelsea, and that she was later exhumed and brought to Canterbury when William, her husband, died in 1578. There is scant evidence of this. The burial vault under the Moore Chapel at Chelsea was already being used by other families by the mid-1540s, so it seems unlikely she would have had the right to burial there. There is a burial vault under the Roper Chapel at Canterbury, but do we know what's in it? Is Margaret Roper's coffin to be seen? And is the head of Thomas More really there? Well, this vault has been opened many times, in the course of its history, and in the scorching summer of 1978, it was the subject of a very thorough archaeological investigation – 
and there is indeed something rather peculiar within. In 1978, the chapel floor was lifted to reveal a set of brick steps in the centre of it that led down to a vault that was under the chapel altar and was the full width of the chapel. This vault was built of brick and seemingly dated from the end of the 16th century and there is some evidence that it replaced two smaller vaults under the chapel. Inside there are found five lead-lined coffins. All were to members of the Henshaw family, the descendants of the Ropers. There was no sign of any coffins of the Roper family from the 16th or even from the 17th century, but that was not particularly surprising. In the corner of the vault, under one of the coffins, was a two-foot-deep charnel pit that was full of bones. This originally had a wooden lid with iron rings. Such charnel pits or bins are really common in English church burial vaults. As vaults were routinely cleared, old decayed coffins removed when new coffins came in, and any disarticulated bones had to go somewhere, and so the pit was made to take them. The pit in the Roper vault, the Henshaw vault, had the remains of eight or nine people in it, and it is likely that among the bones there are those of William and Margaret Roper. This is where it gets interesting. In the northern wall of the vault was a tiny niche with an iron grill in front of it, and behind that iron grill was a lead box containing the remains of a male skull. When the vault was examined previously, this skull was also seen. Dr Richard Rawlinson wrote to Thomas Hearn that he had seen it in 1715. A correspondent in the Gentleman's Magazine in 1837 records that he had seen the skull in 1835 in a lead urn that he said looked like a beehive. An engraving of how it then appeared is in the Gentleman's Magazine and here it is. A hole has been cut in the front of the lead urn at some point so that the skull, which was still intact, could be seen. In 1935, the vault was entered again and again the skull was seen. By the 1970s, the niche containing this skull was hidden behind a stone slab. Within the niche, the lead urn had corroded and collapsed and the skull itself was in many pieces and very much decayed through exposure to the air. Well, we will never know for sure, of course, but there is only really one conclusion that can be drawn from the finding that this is the skull of Sir Thomas More, and that when the vault was cleared at some stage and Margaret Roper's coffin swept aside, it was preserved in this peculiar old niche and protected from theft by the stout iron bars. I can't think why a skull would be so protected, unless it was of a significant individual. There were plenty of collectors in the past who would have loved to have had Thomas More's skull in their collection to sit on the shelf beside their copy of Utopia. Now, above the place where this skull lies in Canterbury is a memorial slab recording its burial here. Thanks very much for watching.